The question of human security, as I was saying uh, before, is not just a formula. It's something very practical. It's something that should be even more practical. In fact, we are going to look into how to make human security possible, how to make people safe. This is what is human security all about. This term was used for the first time in political settings by the former uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, Boutros Boutros Ghali, in 92. And then that was echoed in an ensuing report by the United Nations Development Program. And it became part of the jargon, became part of the jargon in humanitarian uh, settings, in political settings, in peace building settings. In fact, we can very well say that the full agenda of uh, peace building uh, emanates from the concept of uh, human security. So human security means primarily freedom from fear, freedom from want. It means caring for people, making people safer you know, by all means, uh, uh, addressing the needs of people, the societal aspirations of people, basic needs, equality, opportunities. So because of that, we need to understand not just the concept, as I said, but the practices. What are the concrete practices that make human security possible? We are extremely fortunate, as I said, to have three leaders in their respective fields that can tell us about this experience. And I am particularly uh, touched uh, somehow to, to have Murira among ourselves. Munira, I met Munira only a month ago in Geneva at uh, an important conference, the International Leadership Association Conference. And both myself, Alberto Zucconi, and also Rama Mani, who was with us, uh, we immediately uh, tied up with her. Uh, I'll tell you why. First of all, because you see her, uh, she, uh, she is a powerful individual who uh, speaks with her heart and mind. Uh, but also because she found herself uh, in a predicament that unfortunately uh, many other people uh, fell into in her country, that is Afghanistan. Uh, she has been evicted from her country, but before being evicted uh, and becoming a refugee, as you are right now, Monira, I understand, you were the former deputy minister of defense of your country. Uh, with a specific responsibility over education for the Ministry of Defense personnel. Besides that, you are an artist and a poet. And, and here I have initially a question for you. How can you reconcile being an artist, a poet, and a lady in uniform? Uh, because that needs to be uh, in dealing with, with defense issues. Uh, so keep that question in mind. But I also want to complete your presentation saying that Munira was the first woman to become the spokesperson for an important government institution in her country. And keep it uh, with, uh, with yourself in terms of her own background. Uh, she was extremely humble at the beginning of her experience, and she even worked in weaving carpets in a, in a carpet shop but she also taught Afghani immigrants uh, who were not to study, were not allowed to study in, in her own camp, but they studied in, a, in, in Iran. Uh, and then she established a school for Afghani refugee girls, which was later on recognized even by the Iranian uh, government. So with, with, uh, with, uh, with said, I just said, who I think you are, Monira, uh, in, in terms of your achievements. Uh, you, you have everybody who wants to read about her curriculum can do that because we made it available. But now, Monira, the question is really, first of all, how can you reconcile the, the, the issue of being a poet, poet and artist and being uh, and wearing uniforms, at least in, in part of your career? And then second, what is human security for you? Uh, tell us uh, with your heart and mind, with your soul, uh, what do you think that means? Uh, how that can be transformed in something different for people, especially in a country like Afghanistan that has been betrayed, that has been left alone. Uh, 
in a dramatic situation, especially women, children, uh, elderly people, with the famine looming. We know that over 28 million people this winter will be starving. So what does it mean, Monira, I repeat, to be dealing with human security in a country such as Afghanistan? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Der Donato. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished high official present at this conference, professors, experts, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizer of this important and, uh, in, uh, and a valuable conference. Uh, second, I'm grateful uh, for inviting me to this distinguished conference. Uh, I hope uh, that my words, which are the facts and history uh, of the past 20 years uh, progress of education in Afghanistan and, and its uh, future after August 15th uh, this year uh, will be a window to continue to support Afghans who are suffering, uh, to, um, suffering from economic poverty. Uh, still, they are uh, uh, hoping for an Afghanistan free uh, extremism and illiteracy. Uh, today, I want to talk about the education in country that with the, uh, with the help of international community has embarked 20 years uh, of development and support and uh, that despite facing numerous social, security, economic and political uh, challenge, education was forward looking and promising. On behalf of young uh, generation and on behalf of women in Afghanistan, I would like to thank all the countries for their 20 years of support. And I want um, to say that the people of Afghanistan will never forget this generosity. Um, the last 20 years are like um, golden history will be remembered in elementary education, higher education, human rights and support uh, women and youth. Uh, in uh, the last two decades, the significant presence of girls, um, um, as girls in primary and higher education and institutions as, uh, and young um, people as teachers and principals in the fields had, um, felt had been efficient and communicable. For the past 20 years, uh, even thought the fight against terrorism has been the has been at the forefront of politics and the news. But uh, electricity has uh, been seen as a factor in fueling war, or um, uh, fueling war and extremism in Afghanistan. That's uh, why, therefore, it has been decided to open and the gates of public and private schools and university uh, to everyone. The establishment of schools with basic facilities, uh, the existence of unified system, the monitoring of the educational process by international educational institution and the will uh, of the people for education in a country that went through 40 years of war was a message for a better tomorrow. Report from Reportable International Organization showed that despite the efforts of the international community and the Afghan cultural generation uh, to strengthen Afghanistan's education system due to widespread uh, uh, corruption, a false culture was left uh, over from the war and growing activity of, um, of extremists and terrorists as expected, and Afghanistan desperately needed it. Afghanistan's education did not achieve the desired results. The historical shame of the ghost school, the ghost teacher, the ghost student had a clear message uh, that unfortunately some Afghan politicians uh, preferred their interest uh, to the future of this country and made a bad history on Afghanistan that remained a disgrace. Undoubtedly, one of the reasons for the continuation of the war in Afghanistan and the lack of social peace uh, and uh, can be the lack of a standard education and inadequate education. 
Uh, I must point out that where there is no standard education, appropriate education takes its place. Hence, due to incorrect education, the rule-based system of government gives why to the group-based and divisive system of government and such a society is doomed. The temporary rising of the uh, Taliban and ISIS flags at the Kabul University, at the Nengarhar University, the writing slogans supporting the, the Taliban by, um, by university students, and the presence of extremist idea among teachers and even school students were sign of inadequate and quality education in Afghanistan. At this point, I want to talk about a country that they had problem of lack of standard and insufficient education. Improper education began as a child in mosques or madrasas not controlled by government or was outside of, of Afghanistan. These students were used as a soldier to promote inhuman ideologies that danger national peace, social peace, and local development. The notion of that education is just the open, opening of schools, building, and a few structures was common misconceptions of the Afghan people. Although the opening of the school gates can be helpful, the educational content gives the message that, unfortunately, the people with Afghan culture and knowledge were less involved in educational reform and in some cases were not even allowed to enter. As a result, the content of the educational materials was sometimes anti-gender equality and contrary international standard, uh, standards. Unfortunately, Latterly, Afghanistan education system had moved toward politicizations and ethnicization, and it was not a transformational system in which teaching and learning should be a national responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, despite this challenge, many boys and girls had access to, the, to education and at the same time the supervisory role of the international community in addition to financial aid, educational and institutions sought to take steps to standardize educational institutions. Although the steps of standardization and reform were slow, but they were promising. But today, it's very difficult for me to say now that on August 15th, four months ago, we once again witnessed painful devastation in our country, resulting from incorrect peace negotiations and the treason of some politicians in our country. The political collapse of Afghanistan the destruction, destruction of the young democratic system in the hands of the extremists whose crimes the world aware, is aware of turned Afghanistan into a negative transformation and carried public, public, uh, public despair. And suddenly the Afghan education system faced difficult question. Which choice is better? Closing down our schools or opening schools under the leadership of the extremism Taliban. Which is more destructive? Lack of an education system or an existence of a flawed education system leading to extremism. For four months now, schools and university has been devastated under the Taliban's extremist ideology and a new policy is being enacted every day. One, separating the place of education of girls from boys. Two, teaching men to men and women to women. 
Three, changing past educational materials and their approved education materials or Islamic materials. Four, hiring teachers according to the criteria. Five, closing girls' school for, for not a specified period of time. Six, making female professors and teachers stay at home. Seven, uncertainty over the fate of a student, especially female student and art student. I have to say to, uh, with saddens that yesterday's situation like a devastating post earthquake change um, uh, compared to today. I am in daily contact with women and men who do not feel free after the domination of the Taliban. Name the situation aligned in your own homeland. This is very heartbreaking story. But what to do today? What should the world do in the face of this terrible politics fall? The demand for the reopening of schools and the activation, the education system, although changing the situation to some extent in the current situation cannot save achievement, promote social peace and human rights values. The emphasis on reopening schools while good may lead to the activation of the factory for the production of extremist ideas. Imagine please, could the Taliban run education system be anything other than their beliefs and policy? Undoubtedly not. This is point that they need to be take, taken more care of. Why should the Taliban open the gates of schools except to gain global legitimacy and expand its education system through Afghanistan? The spread of the ideas of the Taliban and its terrorist supporters in schools is their transfer from the, the caves called Torobora to the official and numerous stage of schools and university. I call and on their, and I call on all international organization organizer supporting women, children, human rights, and global education policymakers to strengthen the direct oversight role of Taliban run educational institutions. The educational materials of this institution should not change, ne change negatively. Undoubtedly, the education system is the humanizing factor of any society. If the training materials are not made mandatory by the international supervisory committees, we will in fact keep the extremist human turning factory open. I hope and I'm sure that this conference and conference like this will lead the world the view that the Taliban will never want anything but to promote extremism. Let us not forget that a more painful story is about happen to happen and and that is called eyes eyes a black flag that the looks blacker than the taliban does the world want to leave afghanistan alone with the extremist taliban and eyes eyes when its plays permanent role in the ideology of the both religious extremists at the last Thank you for your attention. And I would like to say that the migration of some Afghan elites does not mean salvation. When an extremist education system is active, 
This is the time where not only 35 million Afghans are in danger, but it, the world is in danger of extremism. Thank you. Munira, Munira, thank you very much. Uh, Munira yeah. Yusuf Sada, former Deputy Minister of Defense of Afghanistan, now a refugee, uh, but a political leader even more nowadays than before, and an inspiration for many, many women in Afghanistan and beyond. So we were very pleased, honored to have you with us. Please stay with us. We allotted more time to you uh, because of the importance of your statement, especially at this time, epochal moment in history, uh, and uh, not just for Afghanistan, for humanity, because if we do not realize that this cultural shift is required to promote peace, to promote culture of peace, that where the, everybody is in, interdependent. Uh, and as you remarked, peace in Afghanistan one day possibly will be peace in the world. War in Afghanistan or denigration of uh, human rights in Afghanistan uh, for months down, uh, down the line. Uh, and, and what you said, you know, and you reminded us the conditions of women, of children nowadays means uh, poverty, means uh, dispossession, not just in Afghanistan. So this is something that we are all embarked on. Uh, we, we have to fight this, this uh, degradation of uh, international culture uh, and the international uh, culture of all civilizations for peace, for humanity. So thank you again for being with us. Monira, you are in our program for further interventions. If you can stay, we'll be very happy. Uh, and uh, let me now pass the floor to the other two speakers. So now uh, I have on the, on the screen, Chantal Lynn Carpentier, who is the president chief of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development Office in New York. Uh, she was previously a coordinator for the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. She worked on sustainable development goals negotiations and the Rio Plus 20 conference. Um, she had interest on environmental, economic, and trade issues. Also, she has a PhD in agricultural and environmental economics. Uh, so Chantal, uh, I mean, you, you are a former colleague of mine, in a sense, I've worked at the United Nations for for 33 years, uh, so and in New York as well. Uh, so I want to hear from you, how do you see uh, the concept of uh, human security evolving? Uh, and uh, uh, what, what is for you uh, the value of human security uh, in a culture of peace? What should, be, what should we be doing? And how do you see also uh, the concrete practices as that I referred to before, shaping? Do we have really concrete practices beyond statements, uh, beyond policies that are somehow uh, following one after the other one uh, and, and, and uh, agreements taken, but not necessarily followed? Uh, what, what do you think is happening right now? Chantal, do you think? Thank you so much, Donato. Thank you so much for WASP for, organ for organizing this and inviting me. And, and I'm honored and uh, uh, privileged to be here with the, the, pa the panelists on this, uh, on this session. So Donato, as you mentioned, you know, UN, human security is an approach to assist member state in identifying and addressing widespread and cross-cutting challenges to the survival, livelihood, and dignity of their people. And, and as we all know, it's achieved through the protection and empowerment strategies for all built on four principles, people-centered, comprehensive, context-specific, and prevention-oriented. Um, and it's proven um, uh, ex uh, extremely useful for the UN um, in terms of support we provide to member states um, across sectors um, and, and um, especially, and this is where I'm just gonna cut my presentation and go straight to it, in terms of addressing the root cause and manifestation of the challenges uh, facing developing countries and where um, human insecurity is present. And this is why I think when you ask where is human security going, 
I think human security is the perfect concept to help us implement the sustainable development goals and the 2030 agenda. Why? Because as I mentioned, um, its principle are to look at the root cause. When we add the, the Millennium Development Goals, um, the MDGs, they were mostly social goals and not looking at the root cause of poverty and inequalities and um, starvation. The SDGs actually look at the root cause and provide um, uh, means of implementation to address the issues. It also, the human security framework allows us to do what is absolutely needed if we want to have a chance at achieving the SDGs, which is to look at the interconnectedness and interdependence amongst the SDGs, but also amongst countries. And I'll just give a quick example here. A lot of countries, including uh, the EU right now, is talking about putting in place carbon border measure adjustment um, to support their green um, deal. And, and that's wonderful that the EU is going forward with this green deal and they want to make sure that they protect um, their industry from leakages of carbon in other countries and for their competitiveness. But what UNCTAD at UNCTAD we've done is to look at the spillover effect on developing countries on this policy. And is this the best policies to achieve that? It does achieve the goals of preventing mildly leakages and it protects the competitiveness of the industries, but it also has large impact on developing countries, which are already uh, extremely affected already by um, the COVID-19 pandemic, the ensuing economic crisis, as well as climate change um, impact. And they have to basically adapt much quicker than we do in the North, because we all know that in tropical and subtropical environment, climate change has a much harsher impact already. And where does human security concept and sustainable development come in is also, you might have heard the Secretary General Guterres say that we're now, um, we need to urgently address the three crises facing humanity. And by that, he means climate change, pollution, and biodiversity. I would add a fourth one, especially post COVID, it was just ex exemplified with COVID, it, which is inequality. So we have four crises that we need to urgently address and we can't possibly address them independently. We have to address them together. And Donato, to answer also your question, these, um, it, these three crises, um, the three environmental one, interconnected one, are creating a lot of hardship in food insecurity and poverty in developing countries, especially the people that are least able to adapt in, um, in to these changes. Um, and that have no insurance or perhaps um, uh, irrigation system when they have a drought. Um, and so it is creating uh, human insecurity. And then if you to put on top of it, the inequality that are being exacerbated, not um, including and perhaps just uh, exemplified by the fact that um, billions of students have been put out of school, but some of the especially in rural in urban areas and in developed nations, students were quickly able to go back to return to online learning. That was not the case for a lot of, of students in developing countries and in rural areas in developing countries. Um, and that means that we further exacerbated these inequalities and created a, a lack um, in terms of education. Um, the application of human security, the, therefore, um, it also recognizes that we need to look at factors that impede economic growth and poverty reduction uh, localized, looking at the specific situation in one country um, and, and to look at deprivation such as education and health and, and care um, and environmental degradation in these contexts specific and therefore requires uh, context specific solution. And um, what we don't have right now is basically a system of education and therefore leaders that are able to address these challenges in an interconnected way, the way they need to be. Instead, we use isolated knowledge, silo approaches, 
and stakeholders such as government or the private sector of the financial sector, the multilateral development bank, each thinking in their turn that they can solve these problems alone, while we know that we can only solve these problems by working together. We need multidisciplinary um, uh, training, we need cooperation training, and we need also systems approach thinking, as well as entrepreneurship mindset, if we want to address these issues. Um, and, and the disruption that we've seen in education, and just to give an example of the interconnectedness of these, has not only affected students, it went well beyond the education system. Closure of education institution and the provision of essential services to children and communities, including nutritious food, so we saw an increase in food insecurity, affect the ability of many parents, especially women to work as their care work went up 30 hours over the, the pandemic and increase the risk of violence against women and girls, creating further wants and therefore not getting us closer to this human security. Education, the NATO, as we know, is a pillar of the 2030 framework for sustainable development, especially if we can revise the way what we teach and how we teach it with an approach of leaving no one behind and starting with the furthest uh, behind first. Um, and so I'll leave it at this and look forward for further discussion and then giving you some specific example of what I think uh, is needed to teach our future leaders to have the right skill to address these four interconnected crises that create the want and human insecurity. Thank you, Chantaline. Thank you very much. Uh, you touched upon the state of the situation, I mean, where we are right now, and you also pointed to some solution. Definitely, definitely education is central to all solutions in terms of human security. And uh, you summed it up very well, saying uh, uh, what we teach and how we teach it. Um, this is probably uh, the real uh, question. Huh? Uh, maybe along the same line of thoughts, I could ask Phoebe to come in. Uh, and uh, as you know, we probably now entered into the parallel session. For us, does not, nothing changes. Uh, we are uh, the same group, quite numerous group of participants, I can see. That obviously uh, means that the conversation uh, sounds interesting to most of the people staying with us. Fabi, Fabi, uh, did I introduce you? Probably I did not. And I would, uh, that would mean really a, a, a bad sign uh, of uh, inequality. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> so let me, let, me, uh, let me address that. Fabi Konduri is a professor of, uh, of sustainable development at the School of Economics, Athens. And uh, she's also uh, the elected president of the European Association of Environmental and Natural Resource Economics. Uh, Professor Konduri held economic positions at Cambridge uh, and London, um, the, the University of Reading, and the London School of Economics. Um, so I think that she also another very relevant remark, I think, is that she is part of the 10 year development plan for Greece. You are working uh, for uh, drafting the, uh, the ministerial committee plan. Uh, so that I find it extremely interesting. So it means that really you have uh, uh, hands-on in terms of uh, developmental solutions. Uh, so Fabi, uh, up to you again. I see that you have an impressive um, picture or, 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 or drawing to, to show and begin your yeah. presentation. Explain that, what it means, and uh, how do you see things uh, uh, getting out of this uh, uh, you know, I eat you, you eat me kind of <laughs> approach. <laughs> uh, is, there, is there any way where we can stop being uh, destroyed by one another? Can we cooperate? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, great thanks to the organizers. As a fellow of the World of Academy of Art and Science, I am always... Um, honored to be part of our events, but also thankful to be part of this community with, uh, which is able to gather so many uh, extraordinarily, and I will say useful people that can really provide solution pathways to the 
um, current chaos, if I am allowed to say that. So uh, as I see it, uh, at, at the moment we are facing multiple crises. They have been um, identified by the previous uh, speakers in this session, the amazing previous speakers in this session, I must say. We are facing the pandemic, the huge recession that derives from the pandemic, the climate crisis, which basically means the, uh, the increased average global temperature creates, translates into uh, increased frequency and severity of um, natural hazards, which uh, kill uh, hundreds of thousands of people and cause uh, trillions of dollars every year um, in terms of uh, loss in economic output and loss in infrastructure. And of course, the biodiversity collapse crisis, the collapse of the ecosystem services on which our production and consumption is based. And of course, there are other sleeping elephants, other crises. Uh, the equality crisis have been mentioned before, equality between genders, between uh, the developed countries and the global south, equality with regards to access to safety, education, and uh, so on. And to add to this crisis, I would add uh, the population increase crisis, the immigration crisis. And given that the world is as resilient as the last country and person in it, we need to really regain the resilience of the interaction between um, humans, nature, and the economy. So the economy and the society are uh, human centric, but they also interact with nature and the interaction of the three has been uh, extensively unsustainable throughout uh, the last century at least. Uh, and uh, we need to regain uh, a, 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 our a pathway that is sustainable in order to create resilience, uh, ecosystemic resilience, social resilience, economic resilience. And indeed, education is the, is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. It's powerful and it's fast. I, I lead an international cult, cult, uh, cluster for research on sustainability transition, and basically it's composed of three big research uh, institutions, one at the Athens University of Economics and Business, one at the Athena Research and Innovation Center, the biggest center uh, in Greece on information technology, the EIT Climate Kick, which is um, uh, basically the biggest European public-private partnership for accelerating um, uh, innovations that are relevant for the transition to climate neutrality. And then in uh, this uh, cluster, I, um, we have the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We work with the Sustainable Solutions uh, Network, uh, a UN initiative, um, an initiative under the auspices of the UN General Secretary uh, with Jeff Sachs at Columbia University as a president. I co-chair the European Hub and the Greek Hub. What we do here, we work on research and innovation, innovation acceleration, deep demonstration, education, training, and policy interface, science policy interface, in order to be able uh, to restore uh, the resilience between the interaction between humans and uh, nature, between the economy, the society, and nature. And just to showcase with a snapshot how um, non-sustainable is our current pathway, I share some um, pictures from the latest United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network development report. This is how peace, justice, and strong institution as SDG uh, is uh, performing. And uh, basically, red means that you are um, facing huge challenges in order to implement the SDG 
16 relevant for peace, justice, and strong, uh, strong institutions. Orange means you, uh, you still have major challenges. Yellow means minor challenges. And green means you've actually achieved the SDGs. And you can see our planet dressed in red, meaning that we face huge challenges in most of, of the places in the world uh, in implementing this SDG. And although the situation is better when we uh, picture the power partnerships around the globe, we still face huge challenges uh, with regards to partnering in order to help each other and increase and enhance our ability to implement the goal through collaboration. And if you look at the quality of education, uh, SDG 4, again, uh, the situation is better than the previous SDGs that I've shown case but um, you can see that there are many places in the world, especially in Africa, where we have red and uh, many places in the world where we have orange. And this shows, uh, shows uh, how uh, the different countries across the world can ensure mm -hmm. an inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. And finally, this is the snapshot of how we affect other countries, the spillover effect of each country. And this basically shows how much we care for other countries. And the deeper the, the blue, the better the country in um, producing actions that have positive effects on other countries' abilities to achieve the SDGs. So all these pictures show that we really need to work much more on working together in order to secure the implementation of the SDGs, uh, the only other global agenda, together with the Charter of Human Rights that uh, can protect people and can showcase a vision for the future that is sustainable, that is not um, uh, uh, reducing the ability of uh, the current future generation to enjoy a, a, a welfare that is um, at least as good as the welfare of the previous generation. And what we have in place, we have the SDGs and the 169 goals, the Paris Agreement. In Europe, we have the European Green Deal that tries to put into the center a green and digital transition that leaves no one behind in order to produce positive growth uh, multipliers, uh, produce new jobs, and ensure that everybody is engaged in this uh, um, uh, transition to a prosperous, a sustainable future uh, via enhanced social cohesion. And after the COVID, we have the next generation EU that finances, creates fiscal space for transformative public investments in order uh, to really accelerate the green and digital and social cohesion transition. And in 2021, we had many laws, the climate law, the EU taxonomy, the Fit for 55 package, uh, just to uh, end up with a, a, a map where Europe, of course, is more advanced in terms of uh, climate neutrality and resilience because it has put into place regulations and, and laws and directives that actually uh, support the transposition of the European commitments uh, into actual action. But we also face a big momentum around the world of uh, pledges for climate neutrality around uh, mid-century. This is important because it shows the potential of the globe to really collaborate in mitigating a public a global bad, which is climate um, uh, crisis, climate change. And if we see what happened with COVID, the, the production of the vaccine, not the deployment, but the production of the vaccine is again showcasing the ability of people to collaborate in order to mitigate a crisis. 
And uh, what I want to um, also share with you is that this transition is really a science-driven transition. It needs a holistic interdisciplinary uh, framework of analysis that is driven by science and that is uh, engaging uh, the, uh, the public, everybody, through a big investment of upskilling and reskilling. And this is something that we document in the two basic response, uh, reports that we produce is SDSN Europe, the Sustainable Development Report, and the report on the transformations for the joint implementation of Agenda 2030 and the European Green Deal. I will close here by saying that the transition is driven by science and technology by digitalization, renewables energy, circular economy, nature-based solutions, adaptation projects. It also uh, driven by sustainable land use and food system. Both the energy system and the land use system are going to be transformed through innovation. Innovation leaders in the world now, the green and the blue bubble on this slide is India and China. So one crucial element in this transition is education. The ability of our universities to produce people, to produce citizens that are able to work in interdisciplinary holistic frameworks that understand the interdependency between the different SDGs uh, that are able to connect education, research, and entrepreneurship. And we have produced the getting to getting started with SDGs in universities, our SDSN uh, framework. And uh, here we showcase how our education can be transposed into something really um, uh, into something that can support the implementation of SDGs. A major initiative, which I will be able to discuss later on, on education for sustainable development and global citizenship. And of course, the firm belief that when you upskill and reskill the people, it is uh, important to do so, not just to find the, 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 the labor force for the new transform era of the green and digital transition, but also to support the vulnerable, those that are going to be uh, facing regressive effects from the transition to sustainability. And one final remark among closing, whatever the developed countries are able to do with their fiscal space and their financial resources will not be enough. The um, developed world should show solidarity in terms of financing for a green and digital recovery in the developed world, increased lending to multilateral development banks to provide low-income countries, developing countries with funding for achieving a sustainable um, a recovery from COVID from achieving to attract the technology that is needed for this recovery, the funds that are needed for the public infrastructure, but also for investment in education. And um, keep in mind that all the public money of the world will not be enough to uh, pay for this transition, both for the developed and developing world. We really need to work with the private sector and create a welfare increasing public private partnerships. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fabi. Thank you very much for expanding our knowledge uh, around uh, so many issues, you know, in spanning from culture to environment uh, to, to peace and security.